How many know God's good? How many know God done for you what you couldn't do for yourself? How many know that God woke you up this morning and not you yourself? See, it wasn't about the alarm clock, because I know a lot of y'all didn't have one. So it was God that reached down and touched you this morning and said, wake up. See, a lot of people didn't wake up. See, that's why every day that you wake up is another chance to do right. And when I say do right, do right because it's right. Not because somebody making you do it. And God's got a way of blessing you without measure. When I say without measure, I mean God's got a way of doing things that you couldn't even think of. But then we got that little bitty mind. You know, we, 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 we think that uh, everything's about us. And we create, we, we, we make everything happen. It's not so. That's why we in church today. A lot of us here because they was kind of mandatory to come. But then a lot of us are here because we want to be here. Because we know what God can do for us. How many know that God is the reason for the season? Can I just get a hand clap for the ones that know that? Because a lot of people don't know. You know, they're talking about me now. You know, I wasn't raised in a church. But I got old enough to realize that what I was doing wasn't working. You know, they got a scripture in the Bible that says, when I was a child, I acted as a child. I did childish things. But when I became a man, I put it away. Well, some of us still trying to hold on. And it's time to put it away. It's time to let go and let God. Amen. 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 And that's why God saw fit to let us walk into the house of the Lord one more time. Did anybody hear me? Amen. One more time. You wasn't rolled in with your tongue glued to the roof of your mouth. Can't say nothing. Just laying there, everybody staring at you. God saw fit to let you walk in. We know we got people that got hands won't even clap. But then we got people that got don't have hands would love to clap. My God. Lord, look down on us and fix us. Because we cannot fix ourselves as you can see. And that's the reason I'm before you today. Because I could not fix myself. So I did have enough sense to know that I need to ask God for help. When did that happen? When my back was against the wall. When I had nowhere else to go. I've been to jails, been to institutions. Only thing was left was death. But God said, not so. Because I got a work for you to do. And the work that I got for you to do, no other man can do it. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Same thing. God said, I'm not a respectful person. He said, what I've done for one, I'll do for another. What I'm telling you today is God got a work for you to do. And he wants you to do it. Because can't nobody else do it. And you know what happens when God gives you a reprobate mind? He's done with you. It's over, pretty much. Hallelujah. But since all of us know that God can do for us what we can't do for ourselves, let's just give him a hand praise right there. That's a good spot to give him praise and to give him glory. Thank you, Jesus. Well, if we would all stand.
Heavenly Father, I'm just here to say thank you for another day, God, that we have never seen before. Lord, we just thank you for waking us up today for that, this day. Because you said tomorrow is not promised to none of us. Thank you, Jesus. For the roof that you put over our heads. For the bed that you laid us lie down in last night. For the food that you have put on our tables, Lord. Lord, we should take none of that for granted, Lord. Lord, I have got so that I even thank you for the ice cubes in my refrigerator. Because I know some people don't even have refrigerators. Thank you, Jesus for looking out for us, for looking out for me, for giving me the sense to know that it's you and you alone that brought me this far. And Lord, I'm going to be careful to give you the praise, Lord. I'm going to be careful to give you the glory, Lord, because I already know without you it would be no me. Because I've been there already, Lord. I was blind and I could not see, but then you opened my eyes. And I'm just telling you, thank you. Not here for no show, no fashion, just to tell you, thank you for everything you've done. The things we see and the things we do not see. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Jesus. They got a saying, if you don't do another thing, you have already done enough. You have brought us this far. And we will give you praise. We will give you glory. We will give you honor from this day forward. In Jesus' name, we all say, amen, amen, amen. Our belief concerning the Bible. Our belief concerning God. Our belief concerning the church. We believe in the blessed hope which is the record of the church of Christ in Christ's return. Our belief concerning sin. We believe that the only means of being cleansed from sin is through repentance and faith in Christ. Our belief concerning the salvation. Our belief concerning in Christ. Concerning Christ. We Our belief concerning the Holy Spirit. We believe that the baptism of the Holy Spirit as recorded in the Bible in Acts 2 4 is given to all the believers at the Our belief concerning sanctification. We believe in the sanctifying of the Holy Spirit, who empowers us to live the Holy Holy Spirit in this present life. Amen. Give God praise in this place. Come on, worship Him. Give God glory. Magnify His name. He is the true and living God. He is the only God. The only one is God, our Savior. Amen. It's always good to give God praise in this place. Amen. I always tell you all the time, don't praise him how you feel. Amen. Praise him because he's good. Praise him because he's worthy. Because he woke you up this morning, he made a way for you. Amen. And he has brought salvation onto you and made it available freely unto you. Amen. We ought to continue to praise God for everything that he's done for us. Amen. I thank God for being here today. Amen. I thank God for his grace and his mercy that he showed upon me. Amen. I'm thanking that he keeps me. Amen. I thank that he blesses me every day. Don't have everything I desire, but I have enough. God has blessed me with enough. Amen. I am content by what God has given me. Amen. I'm expecting greater things now, but I'm content for what I have now. Amen. And you all need to learn to be content where you are. Amen. Because God is our provider. And he provides for us no matter what state of life we are in. He always makes a way. Amen. And I live in that faith that God will make a way. There was a time 
when I didn't know how I was going to do it. There was a time when my faith may not have been that strong, and I panicked, didn't know where things were coming from, but then I grew up, and then my faith got strong, little by little, when I saw God doing things for me. When it seemed like the stuff I was worried about, it always worked out some kind of way. May not have been glamorous, may not have been a miracle, may not have been a light shining from heaven, but God always made a way. And when I saw little by little how God is able to make a way, then my faith increased. And every time something new came up, I made a habit of telling myself, I'm not going to worry about it. You can't change it. You can't do nothing. So all you can do is wait. Wait until your change comes. Wait until God makes a way. But I promise you, he will always make a way. He will always make a way. And he'll use whoever he will to make a way for you. See, sometimes we look for the miracle, and sometimes the miracle is not just an angel showing up in your living room handing you $100. Sometimes it's people you know that God has touched their heart to give you the money or to give you what you need. And it doesn't matter where it's coming from, it's God making a way for you. So be, don't be so proud that when you're asking God for something, don't be so proud that you don't like the way God give it to you. I believe there was a man in the scripture that was ill and he was sick and he went to the prophet and he asked the prophet for healing. And the prophet asked him to go dip in a river, in a muddy river. See, you can't worry about how God heals you. What you have to understand is it doesn't matter how he does it, as long as he does it. Sometimes your deliverance is not pretty, but as long as God is in the deliverance, it doesn't matter what he's doing or how he does it. It's just the fact that God has delivered you. Eventually, he didn't like it, but eventually the man obeyed and God healed him. So don't worry about where your blessing comes from. Don't worry about where your way, how your way is made. Just thank God. Amen. Just thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How many of you believe that? Anybody have an experience with God in this place today? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, God is not somebody you can just pop out of the box like Jack in the Box. God is an experience. People want to ask you, is God is real? Tell them about your experience. If they don't want to believe it after that, then that's on them. But as long as you know what God has done for you, as long as you know that God is real in your life, as long as you know what God has done for you, that's the real experience. Amen. I thank you. Praise God. Amen. I'm going to stop with that. Amen. You can take that as an appetizer. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Amen. Man, first, I just want to give an honor to God who is the head of my life and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who washed us from our sins, and the Holy Ghost who leads and guides us every day. I want to give an honor to our bishop in his absence. Yes, yes, amen. Yes. Give an honor to the ministers, amen, to the mothers that are here, the missionaries that are here, amen, to the deacons that are here, and to all of you, the people of God. Amen. It is good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. And it is good to come together. Because when you come to this place, it's a, first of all, it's a place of worship. And as I said before, this building is not the church. The people are the church. The building is where the church comes to worship and give God praise. Amen. Because when you are in Christ, you become the church. Amen. So I thank God when we all come together. Amen. It gives us a strength. It lets us know that we can make it. Because when you hear the testimonies and you see somebody else clapping their hands and you see somebody else thanking God, that lets you know that you also can take part in the prayers and the worship. That it's okay for you to lift up your hands and magnify the Lord. It's okay for you to say thank you. And he's not here to worry about your sins and what you've done and what you didn't do right. He wants you to give him the praise in this place. This is a judgment-free zone. You can lift up your hands and give God praise. Amen. Nobody's worrying about what you did last night. Amen. So I thank God for being here. Thank God for this opportunity to stand before you. Amen. And preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Lord, I thank you and I glorify you, Lord. I ask that you be with me, O oh God. You are my strength and my help. 
Lord, I ask that you allow this word to go forth and let it encourage and help somebody and bring knowledge unto your people and understanding. And we thank you and glorify you in Jesus' name. Amen. Can you do me a favor and clap your hands one more time? Amen. I always like God's presence to be in the room. And praises invokes the presence of God. In fact, the scripture said that he inhabits the praises of his people. And you want to see God show up, just start clapping your hands and giving God praise. And he will inhabit your situation. As you all know, I'm continuing on um, with the series. And uh, God put it on my heart because I think in light of the times that we're living in, we really need to understand what's actually happening around us and understand that this life, the things that we see that's going on, uh, all is coming up to a plan of God. Some of the tragedy, some of the good thing, everything that we see going on in the world is leading up to something. So we don't get confused and think that this life is just all there is. That we just live, go through our troubles, go through our situations, see tragedies, have good times, and then we die, and then there's nothing else. Hmm. Amen? I want you to know that there is something else. There is something that we're waiting for. There is something, a, a plan that God has for this world. So don't be hopeless about everything that's going on. I know it seems chaotic in the world, but trust me, God is in control. God is in control. And... We study the scripture in order to find out why and how he's in control. And I started off, as a review, I started off showing you how it all began. Showing you how God created everything. Don't make no mistake, we wasn't seeded by no alien. God created all things. Amen. By his mouth and by his word. He yeah. said, let there be, let there be this and let there be that. Yeah. And it was, because that's just how powerful our God is. He can speak things into the into existence. But you can't put that on somebody else. Y'all follow what I'm saying? Your salvation cannot be somebody else's salvation. Because you're strict at certain things and some other people choose to do it a different way. You can't we can't sit up here and devour one another and say, I'm saved, I'm more saved than you and you not saved. Come on, come on. Because none of it avails anything if you don't have faith in Christ. Amen? Because there are people that dress the part, but in their heart they're evil. You ever seen somebody who proclaim Christ all the time, but they are the meanest person you've ever seen? And they, and they do everything opposite of what they say out of their mouth. But they name the name of Jesus. They'll tell you off in a minute and then call on Jesus. So you can't put something on somebody because none of it justifies us. Only Christ can justify us. Only your faith in Christ can bring you to this justification. So we're going to jump down to the same chapter, verse 13. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by the love serve one another. Now we move into another understanding of this. Now that I've explained all that to you, he said we have liberty in Christ. We are not under any more some type of strict way we have to live by. We are not under somebody else's idea of salvation. He said, we are under this newfound liberty. He said, but don't use this liberty as an opportunity to sin. To say, oh, now that I might have faith in Christ, I can just do whatever I want to do. He says, hold up, I understand. But that doesn't mean you can just go crazy now and do anything. You still have to have some type of sense of restraint. So, let's understand what this is. He said, don't allow this liberty to be an occasion for your flesh. Don't just say, well, 
The preacher said, because my flesh, I can't help myself, so I'm just going to sin. I'm just going to steal everybody's stuff. I'm just going to be a klepto because that's who I am. I'm just going to cuss folks out because that's who I am. Because I'm under Christ now. So I'm justified. I can tell you off, but now I'm justified. I can steal your stuff, but I'm justified. But Paul said, no, no, no. Don't use that freedom as liberty to do wrong. Because God still watches us. He said, but thou shalt love. He said, uh, excuse me, by the flesh, but love serve one another. Now he's getting to the key. He's getting to the point of understanding this life that we live. Now that we're in Christ, he's asking us to allow love to abide in us. Because if you learn really how to love and what love is, you really won't do wrong by people. You won't murder people. You won't do all the things that people do that we see going on out in the world if you learn how to love. He said that is the key to all of it. Now that you are in Christ, learn how to have the love of Christ truly in you so that you won't do the things of the flesh. He says, this I say, then walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So how do we deal with this struggle? We keep walking in the spirit. Sometimes we mess up, but you get back up and you keep walking in the spirit. Up, oh, did that wrong, keep walking in the spirit. But don't allow the enemy or people to condemn you. You just get back up and try it again. Amen. Because if we're honest with ourselves, none of us do everything that we should do. None of us do everything that God wants us to do. But because of his love, it overrides our wrong. But because of his love, he gives us grace. Because of his love, he don't put you out every time you mess up. He don't put you out every time you think wrong. But what God really expects from us is to make an effort to do right. Doesn't mean you're not going to stumble along the way. But every time you stumble, make an effort to get back up. Because if you stay down, then you get in the danger zone. If you stay down and stay under, to, under condemnation and allow people or the enemy to condemn you, then you'll always stay under condemnation. Yeah, yeah. But if you understand that you are not under condemnation every time you do wrong, then faith kicks in. Then you say, you know what, I messed up, but guess what, I'm not under condemnation, so let me walk back up here. Because see, in the old way, if you were under condemnation, you weren't allowed up there. But because now that you are saved, the liberty that we have is now we can come back. That's why Jesus told the whole story of the prodigal son. Because the son had messed up. And he messed up bad, but his father still took him back and he knew to come back. So it doesn't matter, per se, that you messed up. Just know how to come back. Because that's where faith is. Because now that you have faith in Christ, now that you know that you are under grace, now that you know that you are not under condemnation, you have the liberty to walk back up to God. Under the law, you couldn't do that. And sometimes under old mentalities, you couldn't do that. But I want you to know in this modern time, the liberty that you have in Christ. But don't use it as an occasion to do wrong, Amen. as we're getting into now. I'm trying to go through all this real quick, because I don't want to bore you, but I want you to understand. Verse 19. So now Paul is saying, since I said that, let me stop for a minute and tell you what the works of the flesh are. All those things that we fall into that I was just talking about, those struggles we have. He said, Paul says, well, let me explain to you what they are, what the works of the flesh are. So he says in verse 19, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which just means they're evident. We see it. We know it. We understand what people who sin do, people who are in sin do. We under, these things that he's saying I'm about to read off, you know. You done been there. Some of us have done that. Which are these? Adultery. Don't be unfaithful. Right? 
I mean, we don't have to really explain that. Don't be unfaithful. If you commit it to a person, be committed. Because this is what love requires of you. If you love somebody, you're going to be faithful. But if you're out of love, if you're not committed, you're going to commit adultery. You're going to fall into that. Amen? So that's why marriage is work, as people say. Sometimes people think that it's all about just the work of learning to live with a person, but it's also work learning to overcome the temptation to go somewhere else. Because, let me explain something to you. Just because you fell in love with that person at one time, and now you 10 years in, <laughs> don't mean that you are blind to every other woman that's out there. Don't mean that you're blind to every other man that's out there. Come on, preacher. Because God has given us a, a natural desire for one another. Because this is our flesh. So just because your wife is beautiful, but she's not the only beautiful one. <laughs> but if you don't stay committed, you'll fall into adultery. But if you do, you can still come back to Christ. You may not can come back to her, but you can come back to Jesus. <laughs> Witchcraft. Oh, excuse me, I, 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 I jumped ahead. Fornication. Fornication means having sex outside of marriage. That's what it is. God honors our relations within a marriage covenant, but out of that marriage covenant, not so much. Now, we all know people got problems with that. <laughs> all of us at some point have been into that. Maybe you haven't. Maybe you 40-year-old virgin. Mm. Maybe. Maybe you're not. But what, even in that, if you fall into fornication, if you are in Christ, you can come back. Amen. Mm -hmm. This is the point I'm trying to make. No matter how bad our mistake, you can come back. But should you fornicate? No. But if you do, you can come back. And what I want you to understand about some of this stuff that I'm going to continue to read, what God is looking at not a moment of mistake. But what he's really looking at is a lifestyle. Some people's lifestyle is to hit it and quit it. Ain't that what we use today? Some people's lifestyle is to target people just to have sex and move on. That's the lifestyle of sin in that arena. However, some of us may just fall into the mistake of fornication because God gave us a nature. You sitting in a room, you alone, ain't nobody around, you playing the right music, he's smelling good, she's smelling good, we're both looking good, what's gonna happen? <laughs> it's human nature that that's gonna happen. But what you have to learn how to do is not allow yourself to be in an environment that that can come up and you can be tempted by that. Y'all hear what I'm saying? But if you should fall, if that night was good, and everything worked out according to your flesh, and now you feel a little bad, you can still come back to Jesus. Because there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Amen? It's all about a lifestyle, not necessarily a one-time event. Uncleanness. And lasciviousness, they kind of work together. Now that is, do y'all mind if I be real? So I'm that preacher that I like to be real because, you know, we ain't stupid, we ain't silly. That simply means nasty sex. Mm. That nasty stuff, that whipping chain and all that, strang strangling each other, <laughs> doing all that crazy type of stuff. That, that, you know, that stuff that, you know, that's what lasciviousness is. Mm. That's what uncleanness is. I mean, it ain't that Luther type of making love. It's that, I don't even know how to compare it to. It's just that. 
that whipping chain type way, you know. <laughs> but if you enter your whips and chains, you can still come to Jesus. Have faith in Christ. Now, should you be that way? No. Should you try to stay away from that lifestyle? Yes. But if you're in it, you can come to Christ. Because there is therefore now no condemnation. Amen. All right. Let's move on here. I'm trying to work it real quick. I want y'all to get all of this. Idolatry with an I. Idolatry means idol worship. Now, at that time, they would actually have other gods that they would worship. Other cultures would have other gods that they would worship, and they would build statues and idols, and they would fall down and worship them. But in modern times, you don't see that too much, but actually we can still inadvertently have idol worship. Because when you get into something or somebody so much, it becomes your idol. You know, people can become your idol. Now, it's okay to like people, but don't idolize them to the point where you get out of yourself, to the point where you think you gotta be exactly like them. Or you can't live unless you be like them or you live that example. And this is part of the problem why, you know, sometimes we see some of our children in gangs and stuff like that because they have fallen into an ideal, idol worship of an image that's put before them. That's what it is, it's an image. So if you see an image of gangster, that's what you become if you fall to that image, or whatever image that draws you into a way of lifestyle, uh, a way of, in a sense, that you worship it and you pledge allegiance to it, then it's an idol. So don't fall into that. But God is able to deliver you from that. Amen. You can still come to Christ if you realize that you need to get out of that and can come. Some of us now understand, some of us, some of these things we we fall into an extreme level, and sometimes we can kind of dabble in it a little bit. Most of us that are in Christ still have the danger of falling into these things a little bit because, see, now that we have Christ in us, we, we kind of feel bad about some stuff we do. So we, you know, that, that, that flesh draws us, it draws us, we start thinking about it, and we, we start kind of stepping down a little bit because we in Christ and so we're trying to stay good, but you know, I'm kind of being called to this. There's a difference between that than people who don't have Christ who are just out there in it. But the people who are out there in it, when they hear the word of God, they come to Christ. People who are in it, who dabble in it a little bit, and they realize they're wrong, they're like the prodigal son because they were once in Christ, but then they come back. Come on, so I'm showing you the difference of how this all works doesn't mean that none of us are susceptible to this stuff. All of us are. Yeah. Care how saved you are. There's actually a scripture that says, don't talk about other folks because they fall into sin. Bless you. you fall into it. Come on, preacher. Because we can all be tempted. And a lot of people don't want to deal with the reality of that. But we all can be tempted. Yeah. Now, over time you learn, understand, the more God works in you, the stronger you get. Amen. Now don't feel like it's hopeless because the spirit is in you. And what the spirit of God does when you start stepping down, he says, no, I don't think you should do that. I don't think you should go down there. And then because you hear the voice of the Lord, you step back up Amen. because that's your strength. Yes. That's the maturity in Christ. It doesn't mean you don't think about it. it. doesn't mean the thought don't cross your mind and you start stepping down. But because the Holy Ghost is in you, you step back up. Come on, preacher. Come on, preacher. Here. Idolatry, witchcraft, don't play your little board games and sit there asking the spirit to speak to you. Don't get into that. Most of us don't really want that, but sometimes we can inadvertently get into witchcraft. So be careful who you let people in your house and they doing all these little stuff. And I mean, we know there's just so many forms of witchcraft out there. You just have to pray and be careful because even though you may not some of it you may identify as witchcraft, but there are some things that are hidden witchcraft, and you have to be careful. We believe in Jesus. If you go in somebody's house and they got chicken feet hanging everywhere, nope, ain't coming in here today. 
hatred. That's not beyond any of us. Mm. That's easy. Yeah. It's easy to hate people. I'm just being real. Some of this other stuff we can kind of identify, we can kind of stay away from, but hatred, hatred, and reason hatred is so easy because it's not really a physical act. It's actually a, a mind thing. It's something you perform in your mind. You just hate people. This is what we struggle with today, hate, racial, racial uh, hate. Hating people because for whatever reason, we just hate people. Just don't like it. Maybe you were taught to hate or maybe something caused you to hate a person. Somebody did something terrible to you and you can't get over it, so you hate them. Because they were unfaithful or they just did something really bad. But he said, these are the works of the flesh. This is what you, we all are capable of doing. This is what Christ saved us from. I want you to understand this. This is what we're saved from. Doesn't mean that we don't think about it. Doesn't mean that sometimes we don't get in it. But because of Christ, we are always saved from it. We always have access to God's grace. We always have access to his throne. We can always boldly come back to him even though we fall into this. So don't be condemned. Yes, sometimes we know some of us in here have hated. Amen? But we learn to be better. Variance. Variance just means you are everywhere. All out of control. You have various ways, various thoughts. I mean, just everywhere. Just doing everything. Just, so, you know, sometimes you one way and next way you another way. I believe in Jesus. Oh, no, I believe in this. One day you're Buddha worshiper. Next day you're in Christ. Variants all over the place. Can't make a decision. Can't get yourself together. One minute you on Bluff the Road, next minute people see you stand on the corner on Washington Center. I mean, just everywhere. You know how you got some folks who just they just everywhere. Don't don't indecisive. Can't make a decision. Just flow with the wind. Whatever come up, that's what they going toward. Whatever move is going, that's where they going. Variance. No consistency. And we have emulations. Emulations means to emulate, to uh, be like, imitate. Amen? Feeling like you got to be like somebody else. Mm -hmm. You got to dress like somebody else. Just because you see somebody else looking good in something, and you feel like you got to match that. Mm -hmm. Like it's a, some type of competition. You walk in a place, and you get mad because she got on something you got on. So now, you know. <clears throat> or she got something you don't have, so you run back change just so you can match that person. Imitate. Imitate, pretending like you somebody. We used to call it, when I was growing up, we used to call it front. Mm. You know, pretending like you had stuff. Mm. Walking around with a cell phone that wasn't turned on, but you just wasn't <laughs> looking for it. You know. Imitate. Yeah. Trying to be something that you're really not. Stay away from those, but if you are in them, you can come to Christ. Wrath, urge to do anger, always angry, evil, urge to do something. Somebody step on your shoe, you're ready to shoot them. He said, this is the works of the flesh. This is the stuff we see going on in the world. But how do we combat that? The only way we get over it is through Christ. Christ is the only one that can save all of us from this stuff that can bring all of us in from these things that we get into, wrath, anger, uh, strife, seditions, heresies, envying, always envying what somebody else has. Be thankful for what God has given you. You don't have a reason to envy anybody. God has made you a unique person. You are who you are. Your style is your style. You don't have to be uh, showed up by anybody. You don't have to be intimidated by anybody else. Don't envy anybody. Don't wish you were that person because you don't know what that person is really going through. Just because they look good on the outside don't mean everything that's going on the inside is good. Don't mean home life is good. Sometimes you try your best to be like somebody else. If God allowed you to be in their shoes, if God allowed you to do a mental swap, where you actually get in their mind and live their life, you'll find out their life may not be what you thought it was. Right, right. So it's better off that you just be who you are That's and right, accept right. who you are. 
Make your own statement. Make your own thing. Make your own style. That's right. We ain't got no business being like nobody else in this room. We all are who we are. I made up my mind, even in my preaching, I'm going to be who God made me to be as a preacher. I'm not Preflo, I'm not Jakes, I'm not trying to be none of them. God has given me my own calling, and I walk in that. I like preaching like this, because some people like to holler and scream in the mic and make all them blowing noise and stuff like that, and you feel good and jump and shout and don't know a thing they said. <laughs> but I like to preach where people live and be real. Man. So don't envy anybody. Murders, we know that. Don't murder nobody. Don't kill folks. Mm. Every time you get mad, don't go grab, grabbing stuff. He cheated on you. Don't, don't grab the knife. <laughs> she cheated on you, brothers. Don't, don't choke her. No, no. Don't, don't, don't. I know. It's, don't, don't choke her. Don't even shake her real hard, because the more you shake, the closer you get to that neck. <laughs> All of this is stuff we can fall into. <laughs> this is stuff we've seen it. We know we've seen it. Some of our family members have done it. <laughs> drunkenness. Now, drunkenness just covers every addiction. This is just the Bible's comprehension or Bible's understanding of any addiction, not just alcohol, but any addiction. Stay away from it. Now, sometimes we're in it. Sometimes we're in it. Sometimes that's people's biggest struggle, addiction. But there's no more condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. I'd rather have a drunk who believes in Jesus than somebody who say they believe in Jesus. But in behind the scenes, they drinking and then stand up here and pretending like everything's all right. Because God is able to save you from these things. God is able to deliver. Now, I'm just talking about the basics, but as we move on later, we'll find out what deliverance is. We fall into these things, but God is able to deliver us. He said, how many times, Jesus asked them a question, how many times should you forgive your brother? And they were saying three times, once. He said, 70 times seven. Mm. That means, and he talking about just in one day. Not over a year, just one day. Mm. So in a sense, he's saying, always have a state of forgiveness. Because if God can forgive you over and over and over again because you keep falling into this stuff, and every time somebody else falls, you have to learn how to forgive them for their mistakes. Because Jesus also said if you don't forgive them, neither will your Father in Heaven forgive you. So forgiveness is very important. This is why it's important because you're going to fall into some of this stuff one day. You don't think about doing it. You're going to do it a little bit. And that's not pretending. No matter how much in Jesus you are, some of this stuff won't come up. And you're going to need forgiveness. And you're going to need grace. And so if God can give you grace, then you can give somebody else a little yeah. grace. Revilings. Revelings. I looked up the definition and what it really means is life is not a party. Mm. Revilings is a place where people go to drink and do all kind of stuff. Mm. Basically, don't be like Animal House. <laughs> For those of you that remember that movie. But it was just, they just have an all night party doing all manner of stuff. Getting drunk, doing stupid stuff. Life is not a party. Now, I don't mean that all parties are wrong, but if you know that there's a party where they're gonna be doing some reviling, you probably should stay away from that party. Some people set up parties just to do that, just to get drunk, get high, take drugs, sex, doing all that type of stuff. That's what reviling is. It says it's a loud, festi festive gathering. People shouting loud, doing all kinds of stuff, cursing, tearing up the house, drinking, Snorting, doing all kinds of stuff. Stay away from that. That's reviling. Amen? Amen? Don't mean ain't none of us ever been there before. 
but this is the works of the flesh. This is what you should stay away from. And then it goes on to say, and such like things. And he goes on to, he goes on to say, which I've told you in the past, that if you live this lifestyle, you cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So it doesn't really, in a sense, give you a reason to say just because I have this liberty, I can just do it and don't care. Because if you do it and don't care, you can't inherit the kingdom of God. But if you fall into it and you have a sense of wanting to do right, God can work with you. Amen. Now, it doesn't mean that if you do it and Jesus comes, you're going to hell. Because he understands that you fell into it. So that's a hard statement to make. But because of your commitment to him, because you are in Christ, he never gives you up. But get this, I doubt that would happen. Because God knows how to bring everybody home when it's that time. No matter what you're in, God knows when the right time to bring you out. Sometimes we look at people and we just think, oh, they ain't going to never make it. But don't put that judgment on anybody. Because God knows how to bring his people home. Yeah. Those that are his. And if you are his, he knows how to bring you home. Amen. So let's thank God for Jesus. I'm going to stop right there. I just wanted to get all that out. Now, if you continue to read on verse 22, 23, he talks about what the fruit of the Spirit is. And the works of the Spirit. And it goes on to tell you what you should be. This is what you should learn to be. Talks about love, meekness, peace, humbleness, being forgiven. You know, he goes on talking about all those things. You can read over that. He says, This is what I'd rather you be. But there's a scripture that says that if any man sin, he has an advocate with the Father. He said, I don't want you to do these things, but if you do, you have access to a throne of grace. Come on and stand to your feet. heard this word and it's helped you. I want you to think about your own life. Think about areas where you can be better. But what I also want you to think about is if you're in it, if you're not in it, I want you to think about where you really are and be honest with yourself. Because God loves honesty. David was the one that he said was a man after God's own heart. But David messed up. Yes, he did. Big time, a few times. So if you feel like you've messed up, I want you to know you have access to God's grace. I want you to bow your heads at this time. Lord, we thank you and we glorify you. Lord, we thank you for your grace. Lord, we've learned all the things that we can do wrong. But God, we thank you because you are right. And you are righteous. And if we believe in you, your righteousness becomes our righteousness. But God, we do have a desire to be better. And we have a desire to do better. Lord, help us. Save us, Lord. Save us from our minds. Save us from our thoughts. Save us from our actions, oh God. Redeem us, oh God. Deliver us, Lord. Deliver us from this body of flesh. Make us better, Lord. Give us keeping power so that we don't fall into these things. Lord, give us strength to overcome ourselves. And Lord, help us to be better and to be what you would have us to be. In the name of Jesus, amen. Is there anybody in here that have heard this word you realize that you have not accepted Christ, you can come down and accept him. You have not accepted Christ at all. You can come and accept him and be a part of this faith. And have a life that is not under condemnation. Have a life that's free, that you don't have to worry about your inconsistency. I pray for all of you. I love all of you.
Amen. I thank God that he has blessed all of us in this room. Let's all live safe together. Let's all work this life together. The Bible describes it as a race. And if you think about it, it's a race more like a marathon. It's not a race to go fast to get to the end, but it's more of a marathon race. You know, a marathon, people are all straggled out. They're all at different paces. And that's how this walk is. Some of us have learned better. Some of us, are, you know, have, have learned how to be better. Yeah. And we've learned how to stay away from these things. But some of us are kind of further back in the race. But the point is, we're in the race. The, the point is, yeah. be in the race. Because if you're all, as long as you're in the race, you belong to him. And if you belong to him, he knows how to redeem you. He knows how to deliver you. He knows how to keep you. You just got to be in the race. But look, don't let anybody tell you you need to run faster. You're going too slow. Because you got to get there at your own pace. The point is, get to the finish line. You might get there an hour later after somebody else, two hours later. But the point of a marathon is to finish it. It's not to get there fastest. It means finish it. Finish your race. Take your time. Believe in God. Have faith in God. Ask God to help you. Yeah, yeah. But keep running the race. Don't just give up. Don't just give up. If you step down, step back up. If you fall, get back up. And keep running the race. Because if you keep running the race, God will give you grace. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for this time. Amen. Is there any other announcements? Man, God bless you. We thank you all for coming. Thank you for your time. I know it was a lot, but I just wanted you all to hear the word. I want you to understand the reality of what salvation is and what it's not. The next time I preach, I'm going to continue and move on further. But I want you to understand how this really works. It's not about what people think. It's not about people's ideas of what salvation is. It's about what the Bible tells you it is. Amen. The Bible tells you there is no condemnation for them that are in Christ Jesus. You just have to run your race the best you can and keep running it. Amen. God bless you. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for this word. Lord, we ask that you continue to bless us and keep us, oh God. Lord, take us home safely. Protect us from danger seen and unseen. Allow us to make it to our destinations. Lord, we forever praise you and thank you, O oh God. In Jesus' name, let us all say amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. You are dismissed.